Simple Cyber Defense Weekly Updates for November 6, 2021. Welcome back to the Simple Cyber Defense. This week's episode, we're going to be talking about browser vulnerabilities and what they are, what you can do to protect yourself, and how serious they can be. So, my name is Carl. Hi, this is Ahmad. So let's let's begin. So, the web browser is basically the one of the most used applications to get on to the internet and do you want to explain what a web browser is before we get into the nitty-gritty or yeah just just like you said you know it is the, the the most used software pretty much on your on your computer um and now especially with uh, a lot of people working from home and the migration to uh the cloud uh, something as simple as, for example, using your Gmail account. Um, that is that is a software that you use. But that software is, which is very smart and very capable, is not installed on your computer. Um, but you use a full uh, a full suite of software. Like if you use, for example, you log into Google, a single sign-on, and then you, with that, through your browser, you're able to access your Google Drive, your Google Photos, your Google Documents, your, your Gmail, and all that 10 years ago, for example, you had to have software dedicated and installed on your computer for each one of those, right? But now we don't we don't you don't even need to do that. You just go to your browser, you type in one web one web address, you go there, you sign on, and you can do all those things. Now, in addition to that, you can access the cloud, you can access virtual machines, which is totally separate systems from your computer that you can use uh, at an, on a, even on the enterprise level, all through your browser. And so it's one of the, if not the most important piece of software on your computer, right? under your uh, your operating system. And if we look at, for example, th other systems like like uh, Chromebook, for example, all, all it is is a browser. Is a, you know, is a, is a Google Chrome browser that is, and then everything else is attached to it. Because as soon as you log in, as soon as you use that browser, you use it to reach any part of the web to do anything that you need to do, right? um the the thing is with browsers the most important thing that a browser needs to bring to the table is a user experience right we need something that works we need something that looks pretty we need something that doesn't uh show me broken links doesn't show me uh you know broken pictures i want something that's fast right and the last thing that we think about is we want something that is secure or that is private. Well, all those things need to be part of your browser, right? And because of how popular it is as a piece of software, it is the piece of software that is most commonly used for attackers to gain access to your system. Mm -hmm. Think about all the phishing attacks. All of those are made through the browser. Like you click on a link. And then it downloads the malicious software, and then from there it goes to the other attacks. But it all starts in the browser. So, um, so how many uh, browser engines do you think there are out there? Browser engines. Yeah. Mm. Basically, the core that makes up the browser. I. What I, the ones I'm familiar with, I think there are four. You got Internet Explorer, Safari, well, Chromium, and everything that comes from it. And talking about the 
those are the uh, actual browsers, but the actual core engine, there are four main ones. That's, that's There's the funny. WebKit, which is okay. for the Safari browser. Okay. And then you got Blink, which is the Chromium browser or engine. And then you got the Gecko, which is the Firefox. And then you get the Trident, which is the old Internet Explorer one. So, and and usually when developers want to create a browser, they use one of those engines, right? Engines, yeah. Unless you're on iOS, then you only have the WebKit. You can't use any other browser on the iOS. You'd have to use basically Safari, and then just put a skin over Safari. Um, so what do you think is the with the web browser the weakest link in the browser? Uh, the user. I would say it's the extensions. Because the you like you said, the users want everything, like the pretty stuff and all these other functionalities added into the browser. So what they do to make that happen, they go out and install ex extensions. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times some malicious people would create these malicious add-ons for your browser which does which will give you exactly what you want on the front end but on the back end they're doing malicious things like either uh key logging or putting in back doors or just basically spying on your entire network because i know uh I think it was AVG, the antivirus software, hmm. got busted for being a little too much like spyware. And wow. Got kicked off of the Firefox. Uh, okay. Things. But there are other ones that do pop up from time to time that tries to say either they'll enhance your privacy or they'll give you a free VPN or stuff like that. But in reality, they're just malicious software pretending to be something that will help you out. So the thing you have to look out for is if it's a new publisher, kind of, I would say, stay away from those too much until they can build their reputation up a little bit. And kind of be weary of user reviews because a lot of them could be just fake spam accounts especially if they only have five star reviews no mm. one has anything bad to say about it um, because let's face it not everyone's going to be happy with everything that right. people put out so a lot of those things you kind of do have to put with a grain of salt if they only have five star reviews and right Another thing you can try to do and see if a, a security researcher had researched that particular app. You could put the app's name and then next to it put malware or something and see if any interesting articles pop up and say, okay, this is malware and explains what it does and all that stuff. Now, as far as having different numbers like different browsers installed on your system like for example you know some websites will say oh we work better we on, on chrome and some websites say no we work better on internet explorer yeah. um so you, you'll see that you know we one of the things that we we talk about a lot is uh don't have so many things that you're going to need to you know upkeep on patching and security updates and things like that would you recommend only having one browser on your system that you use or have multiple browsers? I would say at most, I would say only have two browsers. What I would recommend is having Chrome and Firefox because those are the two major players on the PC end. If you have a Mac, I would say choose between Firefox, Chrome, and then have your Safari. 
because Safari is going to be built into there, and sometimes Safari will work best for the most part, but then sometimes you'll have to use either Chrome or Firefox or other websites that are just built specifically for that thing. But I would say no more than two, because that way you get into the... Because, let's face it, most of the browsers out there, like you were built, like saying, like, Edge, uh, Vivaldi, and some other ones are all based on Chrome. And very few are actually based on Firefox. So with the browser wars, as they're saying, most of the people who build web browsers build them on the Chromium base. Right. So that's why I would recommend if you're on a PC, have Chrome and Firefox, because they're two different browsers that will act differently and they'll give you different protections. And like, if you want more of a private web browsing, you'll have more options with Firefox, which can squeak a lot more with that. But if you want more of a security end thing, then I'll lean more towards Chrome, because Google does a lot of good with their security side, even though privacy they kind of suck at it because. Well, let's face it. As That's how they make money. <laughs> yeah, well, not only do they make money, but they also need data in order to recognize the threats. Right. So it's kind of like a give and take kind of relationship. Like right. security, sometimes you have to balance between privacy and security. You can't have both at the same time always. So you, you kind of have to give up one for the other in some cases. So um, you had mentioned also the extensions in, in different browsers, right? And um, one of the things that you'll see sometimes on uh, Firefox especially is when you go and install an extension and you've done your research, you, you know, it looks fine. Uh, it's a legitimate company, but then you'll get a warning that, hey, Firefox is no longer responsible or no longer managing the security or the patching of the specific uh, extension. Mm -hmm. What would you do with something like this? Because now you see that Firefox had kind of transferred that that yeah. that management of that mitigation of that risk to the 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 user or to the the creator of that extension. Um, would you shy away from those altogether? Well, I would only because usually when they give that warning, it's because the developer has stopped active development on it. So, because the reason why they're saying that they don't support the updates is because the developer hasn't put any updates or any kind of changes to it for, I think, six months or more. Okay. So then Firefox kind of says, okay, this may be abandoned. But they don't want to say it that way. They just try to say, okay, it's a security risk. Because I think it's more of if people just think, oh, it's no longer being in active development, they'll think, oh, it'll be fine because no one is going to attack it and there's going to be no security flaws. But that's not always the case. Okay. Um, another. Another thing that our browsers do is they're able to process scripts, right? You have uh, like JavaScript, for example, or any any type of plugins that your your browser uh, is able to execute and manage for you. Um, one of the things that you know somebody would do is disable the scripts or disable the, ex the execution of scripts. But the on the flip side of that, if you do that, some functionality of some websites will not work. What is the the happy medium? Where where is the balance there between you know privacy and security and you know a convenient? Yeah, like I said, there is a big balancing act, and what I would do is I have a an extension called no script and i usually only turn on those scripting functions for the websites that need those and keep it off for everything else so if i come across a website that says hey we need javascript to be enabled and i know that it's a good good website 
it's not some like random hacker thing out there. Like if like I know Facebook requires JavaScript to run. So I would just put it on just for those specific websites that absolutely need them. But then other than that, I'd keep them off because you never know when you can run into something that is malicious. I suggest something as simple as a click of a button to yeah. enable and disable the extension. Yep, okay. so you just go to the extension, click on and say, okay, turn it on just for this website. It's not going to be a global thing. And, and then you can even go into like finer details and say which scripts you can allow to run too. If you know what they are and what they are actually going to do. But again, you could also research, like go to a web browser and search, okay, what does this script do? do? And then it'll give you an explanation. Okay, the script is used for these kind of processes. And if you're okay with it, then you can allow it to execute. If not, then you can keep blocking it. Okay. Uh, so which now we that takes us to the next thing, but is also similar is cookies, right? Mm -hmm. When when you when you go anywhere, there is there's a lot of cookies that get, you know, input and saved on your uh on your web browser um and those cookies are to kind of make it easier for you next time you go and you you know go visit that website for example and there is a there is a way for us to either clear the cookies manually or you have your browser clear all the cookies and the cookie history after um each session one of the things that I always wonder is, does it really matter? Because wouldn't the damage already be done while you are in session, while you're using your browser and you already have all those cookies in there? And then you're, you're clear is that when you clear the cookies, is that just like a false sense of security? In some cases, yes, because there are some cookies that can't be deleted, which known as like super cookies. Okay. Um, and also, you have to worry about third party cookies too. Because sometimes you'll get, like, say you logged into uh, Facebook or something. And then you'll jump to another site that says, okay, we were, uh, you can log in using your Facebook credentials into this website. So you're using a third party cookie because you're using a cookie from Facebook to log into this other site. Sometimes those could be used in malicious manners to steal information too. So I just have a habit of just blocking all third party cookies. So that could prevent that kind of attack going on. But again, it'll stop you from being able to log into another website using like your Facebook credentials or your Google credentials in there because it requires third party cookies to be enabled. So again, you have to balance your security with your convenience too. Okay. Um, and another thing you could try doing is if you're not really comfortable with some of these things, you could just create what's known as a virtual machine using VirtualBox, and then run a browser inside that virtual machine so everything's contained within that little virtual machine. So if it does get compromised, you can just delete the virtual machine and everything in there will be destroyed. Okay. And it just, uh, I was watching this video on front from uh, Network Chuck. I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, his videos on YouTube. Pretty good. Yeah, and he, he he had mentioned that you can actually get a free AWS account where you can, through that account, create virtual machines. And it's very simple, very easy to follow. Um, and with, you know, you can have that virtual machine on your computer and anytime you need to access something, just go ahead and, and use that. It's, it's very simple and it's free. And I'll put a so, link into the description of that video that I know what exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So what about, so we talked about um, browsers and browser security, but I feel that that security mindset kind of like starts 
at home with your with your own network that you set up at home, right? Because if you're secure there, everything else is is a trickle down effect, right? Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I was actually working on uh, this last week, and, and I totally, you know, totally spaced out, didn't think about it, is I have a few accounts on my computer. But I use my account and I've used my, that, that account for years just to log into my computer. But then I realized that I have admin privileges on that account, which is, I think, I mean, I consider myself that, you know, I know a little bit about computer security and I still made that grave mistake, which is, you know, when you create this account, yeah, I give admin rights to this. Yeah, why? Because I'm managing the computer because I don't want to have to log in and log out every time I need to install a software. But I would say it's that following the principle of least privilege, right? Yeah. Yes, have an admin account so that you only use to set up your computer that you use to create software you use to or you use to add or remove software, mm -hmm. but don't have it for your daily use. Yeah, even though I am the administrator, the administrator of the computer, I need to have a secondary account that I use to use my that I have to use my computer, right? Because most malware uses that administrative privileges to get exactly into other places that they're not supposed to get into. And if exactly. you have that administrative privileges, you stop them. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, like an example, you know, I'll, an account for me and one for the kids and one for a guest, right? Okay, I'll give myself admin rights. No, don't do that. This is this is. This is a, a, a rookie mistake, right? <laughs> Usually what I do is create an admin account and then one for me, one for each of the family members that are right. all standard, but that one has admin, but just use it specifically for administration functions only. That's right. It. And then uh, another thing is, and, and I, I, I had requested something from you is, and also if you want to put that in the, in the video description, yeah is um and the reason was i received a, a text from a number i didn't know and it had a, a a web link and i didn't want to click on that and it was on my phone and i didn't you know i didn't have a virtual machine on my phone and i said hey man what what can i do to open this link safely you know i, I know i want it i can go home i log into my computer and type that link and open it up in a virtual machine but there are websites where you can copy and paste those links even if it's on your phone, and then it will tell you whether it's safe or not to a certain degree if you want to open that link or not. And that was very helpful. But it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. It's better than just flicking it. You know, we're curious, right? Humans were curious. So you get you get a weird looking email or a weird looking web link from an unknown number. Oh yeah, who who, who is this? Or you know, whose number is this? You'll that for me, that'll be the first thing I go is I'll copy and paste that number in my browser and see who it is. And if nothing comes up, and remember, you're not the only one who, who does that, right? The, the attacker does the same thing, and they'll use a number that you have that has no record on the web, right? And, and the they're like, okay, maybe code. same area code, you know? Oh, that's somebody I know. And no, don't do that. So if you want to do that, put that, uh, you know, in, in the in the description as well. Um, another thing is most of the uh, attacks that are uh, based on the browser, right? Like whether they're um, uh, based on the, you know, because of the extensions, they're known, right? And they have a signature, right? And they're usually easily caught by a, a, an antivirus software. So one of the things that we say is always have that on your computer. This is the, the main reason why you need to have an antivirus um, because it will catch the you know that malware based on the signature that that is known for it right um, one of the another one that is that is um, very dangerous I think we talked about before is it, we talked about a man in the middle attacks well it's there's a similar it's called man in the browser attack right and how would you feel about somebody sitting there literally between you and the server you're trying to access and they see everything on your computer that you're communicating back and forth Even to https because what it'll yeah. do is it'll create a little <laughs> dummy server in between you and the other server you encrypt to them they'll decrypt it 
and then encrypt it before they send it to them so that they get back yeah. they'll they'll be able to decrypt look at everything that they need to and then send it back to you and now they have all the information that you do too right so that's why our vpns on top of that will prevent that from happening because they wouldn't be able to crack into the vpn encryption right yeah i um uh, i think that's that you have anything else to add to that carl uh not on this but i did have some uh kind of sobering uh statistics for our listeners so i was looking up the lists of different vulnerabilities per browser the three main ones i was looking at is firefox chrome and safari so in the year 2021 uh firefox has had 1968 vulnerabilities uh, all of them have been patched luckily <laughs> um, google chrome has had about 286 major vulnerabilities which all of them have been patched so that's good um, and then Safari had only 25 major vulnerabilities, which had been patched. So it's some interesting statistics there that that they have. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't say that one is more secure or worse than the other. It's just it's kind of the fact that attackers are paying attention to the web browser because we do almost everything on the internet through a web browser and so that's why it's very important to keep your eye on on the on your on securing your web browser because if they come up with an update i'd say just patch it right away unless unless you have a specific reason which i don't think the end user really has any of those specific reasons I think most of them have to do with like corporations. Right. They want to the test an user, update or something. Yeah, yeah. The end user, they don't really have to worry about the web browser being compatible with any other types of software because it just needs just to work. And most of the time it does work. So for the end user, I'd say as soon as they get a patch in there, patch right away. And I would definitely get into the habit of at least once a week manually checking to make sure that your web browser is up to date and current because there are some extensions that will block the web browser from actually auto updating to hmm. prevent them from being thrown out of the web browser so just don't always rely on the auto update features because sometimes some malware will actually stop the auto updates from happening or even trick the user in thinking that, oh, you're up to date. So just go into whatever browser you go to and just see what the latest version is through their website. And then just, one, I'd say like once a week, just do that. Just check once a week to make sure there aren't any major updates. And just be very, very diligent on the extensions. I would say the least ex the least amount of extensions you can have the better i would recommend having like an ad blocker like you block origin the no script if you know how to use it and there are many tutorials which we will link in the, to the, the description that will show you how to use that properly and <clears throat> just minor other things like uh password managers definitely a plus in there but try to stay away from anything that kind of says, oh, we'll add different functionalities like uh, a VPN or we will add things to make it look more pretty. It's like, it, it doesn't really matter in my opinion. And it's not worth the risk. Anything you want to add in there? Yeah, that, now that you're talking about extensions, um, like one of the, the things that we need to pay attention to is use a legitimate, like for example, you, you mentioned uBlock Origin, right? If you, for example, if you log into the uh, the Firefox 
uh, extension store, you'll find a lot of extensions that are made so that they're supposed to, it's, they're made to help you with your tracking and with your safe web surfing and all that. But in reality, they can actually be a big opening into your computer, yeah. right? So make sure it is a legitimate, uh, I, I'm all for open source, uh, open source software, because a lot of people will say, no, you know, if it's, if it's open source, then there is more room for people to you know, insert any type of script to that or, or, or a backdoor or whatever. But what I say to that is there are more people watching it to say, okay, exactly. Someone right? added this in here. Don't you don't upgrade to this version. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, you don't know that. Yes. I think that's so, the reason why Apple Safari only has 25 vulnerabilities because it's a closed source piece of software that very few people are ever able to poke and prod into it. I right. Guarantee if Safari became open source tomorrow, that number will skyrocket <laughs> as soon as it happens. Yeah. Not because more people are, you know, able to put garbage in, it's more people are able to see what's in there. Um, now that you, you're talking about the, the big boys, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of like on a tangent, but it's still kind of related to this. What's why are people hating on Internet Explorer? What what is it with Internet Explorer that number one? There's a lot of issues that that it comes with, right? It's yeah. it's why. Well, with Internet Explorer, it uses the old Trident engine which is very insecure and Microsoft tried their best to make it secure and to work well, but it's just, it's, it's a lot of garbage basically. <laughs> but ever since the edge has moved away from their own engine to the Chromium based engine is basically just Chrome with a flashy new look. That's all it is. Okay. Um, that's cool. Yeah. All right. Well, so I, yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, uh, you know, that the, they're using the, the Chromium engine. That's, that's, that's yeah, cool. Uh, that, I think a year ago or somewhere. Okay. Around, they made that switch cause they decided, you know, it's too much work to try to secure or to make a secure web browser that they have other fish to fry. Just look at how many problems that they're having with their OS alone with right. merging issues and network issues and all these people trying to attack them with different zero days, things like that. So they have their hands full just trying to keep Windows operating system secure. So they just didn't have any any time or resources, or I wouldn't say resources, they have tons of resources, but <laughs> they just didn't want to keep up with the web browser. So they looked at Chrome, say, okay, Chrome's very popular. Might as well use it and just call it a day and let Google handle all the security on that end. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sounds fair. Cool, man. Yeah, that, I, think, I think that's pretty good. I got nothing else to add. All right. Well, there's nothing else then that'll conclude this week's episode and just remember be very very careful with your web browsers because it is basically the window to the internet and it will be your number one source for attacks if you're not careful because that internet browser is basically the way everything gets in through the internet and it's kind of scary but as long as you follow precautions you could easily mitigate a lot of the problems that will result of it and with that episode out of the way we look forward to the next one all right see you if you like what was in this episode please consider liking subscribing and sharing with others for more information to suggest a topic or to donate head over to simplecyberdefense.com